Hi. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, everything is working. Perfect. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. So uh, indeed, in the last part of this uh, DS Meetup, Kanté and I will uh, not talk about active learning, but we will present you Iris, uh, which is actually a, a metaheuristic optimization algorithm we are currently employing in the project we are uh, working on. Uh, and that project aims to increase automation uh, rates of mortgages and business lending application. Uh, and in what follows, we will elaborate on both IRAs and on the project. And so, um, indeed, this is the agenda of today uh, for the next 30 minutes. So we will first um, explain the use case a little bit in general and then some specifics uh, for our uh, project, uh, of course. And from there on, we will, um, we will elaborate on the uh, approach used to tackle the problem presented at the use case. Um, so, uh, yeah, we will, of course, present our solution, but also um, elaborate on some uh, pros and cons of, of alternative uh, solutions. And uh, then the algorithm will uh, we employed will be discussed. Uh, and since the results are confidential, we will just share the general trend there. Um, and of course, there will be some uh, time left for a Q&A, so feel free to drop uh, some questions in the chat. So let's kick off then. Um, and yeah, this... Next slide, yeah, perfect. Uh, this use case revolves ar uh, around the acceptance and the rejection of applications uh, for mortgages and, and business loans, as stated before. And the setup for this um, application acceptance rejection process was done uh, many years ago, uh, ago, and it essentially consisted of a rather classical rule-based decision engine. So uh, it works as follows. Um, when a customer applies for a mortgage or a loan, uh, the decision engine at ING receives uh, the application data. And based on that data, the engine actually verifies how, let's say, how compliant uh, the application is within uh, the decision rules set up uh, by business. So to give you a concrete example, if uh, if customer uh, X uh, applies for a mortgage, uh, the, uh, the engine receives the data. And then, um, for example, if rule A is not satisfied, is satisfied uh, then it goes to uh, rule b and if rule b is satisfied the uh, mortgage application is automatically accepted uh, but nevertheless if a business applies for example for a business loan um, and rule a is not satisfied it goes to rule b rule b is neither satisfied then it goes to rule c uh, and let's imagine a uh, rule c tests for example some sectors the bank doesn't want to do any business with uh, if it's satisfied then uh, the business loan will be automatically declined so that's a little bit how this uh, how this decision engine uh, works um, and I've been told that the image you see here is, is one from Porsche, meaning that when this rule-based decision engine was set up, uh, the whole process was, was very efficient, so it was transparent and the employees understood the, the reasoning uh, behind the different rules in, in the engine. But uh, nevertheless, as time goes uh, goes by, some problems arose uh, with this kind of setup and the previously uh, very yeah, fast, uh, efficient, clean uh, decision engine became uh, a labyrinth of, of rules where nobody can really see the forest for the trees and um, people who added uh, certain rules, for example, Dave, uh, which you see on the on the bottom right uh, of, of this figure, he added the rule in 2010. Uh, but he doesn't, he does not longer work for ING. And so uh, the new employees don't really understand what is behind uh, the rule. Um, and often, um, yeah, documentation is not really there or it's not, um, it's not, um, yeah, up to date or detailed enough to really understand, uh, the, yeah, the update of the rule or the new implementation of the rule. Um, and so. Yeah, next slide. So this slide actually uh, is a little bit a summary of, of our use case. So let's say 15 years ago, um, this rule-based decision engine was developed and automatically accepted, uh, automatically declined. But for our case, also very important, uh, it can manually decide upon acceptance or rejection of a, of a loan application. And so um, at that time, the results were very satisfactory. Um, automation rate uh, was quite high, so meaning a lot of applications were automatically decided to reject or um, or um, or accept. Um, and also, other KPIs looked quite promising. For example, uh, yeah, another relevant KPI is sales. Um, but today. Um, yeah, and this yeah this reason was of course because yeah the rules behind the engine were still uh, relevant for the co context then, uh, but today uh, in 2021 we are left with a 
yeah, with a complex version of that uh, good engine, and uh, which is actually the result of inserting new rules without really doing a ch sanity checks on uh, the rules which are already in place. Um, and so a lot of rules on, are no longer relevant in the current context. And uh, as a result, the, the automation rate uh, dropped a lot. And also uh, other KPIs leave leave much to be desired today. And uh, so therefore we were asked, asked by business to, uh, to take a look into uh, how we could uh, tackle this, this problem. Um, and by uh, we, I actually uh, mean the BADAS team. BADAS is, is quite of a little bit an artificial acronym. It stands for uh, Belgian Advanced Data Science uh, Service. And uh, the goal of the team is, is, uh, is to impact and to uh, disrupt uh, the business by uh, delivering projects. Uh, the projects uh, yeah, are mainly done for, for different departments within ING. Uh, the team is part of, of um, the former one-to-one -one analytics, uh, no uh, digital sales and uh, no better known as digital sales and customer interaction uh, tribe of ING. And uh, there are currently seven members. Uh, we're working in Belgium. And if you're an ING uh, employee and you're interested in the projects we already worked on or we are working on right now, you can, uh, you can uh, take a look at uh, the link provided on this slide. Okay, but so uh, we took a look at, uh, at, this, prob uh, at this problem uh, and we mainly identified uh, two approaches uh, we could take to, uh, to tackle uh, the problem. So the first approach would be to just uh, dump the current uh, rule-based decision engine, um, never take a look at it and replace it with a, with a machine learning model. Um, the advantage is there is that like, there are quite some cool new and maybe not so new techniques available, which would uh, result, um, yeah, which would yield quite good results. Um, and, um, but the main disadvantages there are, uh, yeah, it's quite difficult to achieve business buy-in um, because it, uh, the machine learning model uh, often functions as some type of black box for stakeholders, which is, of course, not uh, not desired. Uh, and another point is that uh, if you if you really um, yeah set up a new machine learning model, uh, it often takes quite a long time uh, to to run through the whole validation process because you're putting a new mod model uh, there. And it also begs the question: where do you want to put it into production? And this is also a very time-consuming uh, exercise, of course. So. Then the other approach um, we, we identified was the one we, we went for in the end, uh, which is just to um, yeah to optimize the the current uh, the current rule set, and um, so bring it back to that uh, to that very efficient Porsche engine it uh, was back in back in the time. Um, and the advantage there is that like there's still uh, quite some cool techniques available. There are quite a lot of uh, optimization uh, algorithms. Um, the, the one you choose, of course, depends on your use case. They're, they have certain pros and cons, uh, which is not too surprising. Also, uh, the results uh, are good. And um, the main advantage there is interpretability because business stakeholders already know how the rule-based decision engine work. They, they might not understand all the, the rules um, behind it, uh, especially not nowadays, uh, but they, 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 yeah, they understand the functioning of it. Um, a very big advantage is also that it's, it's way easier uh, uh, for validation because you're just uh, presenting an, an, um, an optimized version of the one that is already in place. Uh, so it takes less time. It's not so disrupting for business. And uh, it's, already in pro it's already in production, that rule-based decision engine. So you just need to adjust it. And that doesn't take, uh, doesn't take so much time, like max uh, a day or, or some days, whereas if you, um, if you replace it by a new mach machine learning model, it might, uh, it might easily take some, uh, some months to, uh, to put that model into production. Uh, and so we went, uh, indeed, for, uh, for the last approach. And I will now give the floor to Quentin, who will elaborate on the approach and on uh, Iris. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, so going back to the title, the very lengthy title of the talk, which is about it being a meta heuristic, et cetera, et cetera, I'll go uh, with you a bit more into details in the concept behind Iris, behind uh, the optimization algorithm that we chose to use. Uh, but first, kind of a top-down view of, in general, you know, what, how are we applying an optimization algorithm to this, um, to this business case, to this, to this use case? 
it doesn't matter too much on this slide yet what exactly does iris do uh, because it would be the same if you chose to use any other optimization algorithm uh, because in the end we what we have is we have you know as our input we have a bunch of data which is let's say a few years of historical data um, representing all of those loans as Nela explained a bit all of the loans that come into ng um, and we have in that historical data of course you know all the characteristics all the features that the business rules in the decision engine look at but because the historic data we also have what was the historical decision coming out of the decision engine and was it a good loan to accept meaning did it in the end result in a sale and did it in the end uh, result in a default or not for the client um all that is available, of course, because it's we're looking at historical data. Next to that, we also have, of course, the rules that are in the decision engine, right? Uh, and in fact, because we're trying to optimize those rules, we are using meta parameters of the rules. Uh, and namely here, in our case, what we are doing is choosing which rules to keep on and which rules to turn off completely. So which rules within the decision engine should be kept active and which ones we are just not going to run anymore uh, in, in throughout the optimization. Um, as well as for each for some of the rules, maybe not all of them, exactly what the output should be. So as Nero said, right, it's a three classes uh, problem that we have at hand, uh, either automatically accept, reject, or not sure, give, it, give the hand to uh, a manual person to take over. So some of the rules, we could cha change the type of output, namely going from a rule that says, it looks a bit risky, but I'm not sure, let's go to manual, to changing the output to, okay, it looks a bit risky, let's automatically reject it, uh, which for main KPI of automation makes a lot of sense to skip the manual step. If we're thinking it's gonna get rejected anyway manually, might as well reject it in the first place, uh, as well as for a lot of the rules, Right, as you can imagine, everyone I think is probably familiar with what business rules look like. A lot of them are just, if the amount is greater than this threshold, then yes. And if that other amount is lesser than the threshold, then no, it should be rejected. Well, those thresholds uh, are also obviously meta parameters, let's say, of that um, business and business rules engine. Uh, and those are parameters that we can tweak with that uh, optimization algorithm. Uh, of course, what the optimization is doing is trying to optimize something, right? It's optimizing a metric. Uh, namely, in our case, we were optimizing the automation rate that we have uh, behind it. So how many of the applications and how many of the loans end up being automatically accepted and automatically rejected in a way that uh, was positive, so meaning with this back testing on the historical data, we're interested in accepting the non-defaulting and rejecting the defaulting, for instance, would contribute more to the automation. Um, and next to that, because, you know, of course, if you're just optimizing the um, automation, why not just turn off all of the rules and just accept everything, right? Then it's 100% automated. Obviously, that's not great. There are other key uh, performance indicators that we want to keep a hold of, and that's why we have uh, an extra layer, let's say, of constraints on top of it all uh, to stop the optimization from going crazy and just turning off everything. Um, namely, on the other KPIs that we're interested in, and it's a, a clear credit risk use case, so I don't think it will come as a surprise that we're talking about you know, the default rate and the a sales KPI, let's say. Um, that's what we're interested in. So. The general top view uh, approach is we take all of these different aspects, we put it all in this nice optimization algorithm, namely Iris, um, let it run for a while, does its thing, and then the output is an optimal set of uh, parameters and an optimal set of rules based on those parameters that the algorithm has found as being the optimal one. And then we can validate um, checking all of the different KPIs, both the optimization uh, one, so the automation and all of the other key performance indicators on uh, a validation data set. That's fairly similar to just applying machine learning. The main difference being, 
our output is not necessarily a trained model. Our output is these are the rules you should keep on in the business decision engine. And then it's a very easy change, as Neil was explaining just before. It, it should be a very easy change to essentially redeploy the decision engine as is with less rules into it, right? It's that's kind of less rules, and some of them tweet with the threshold is, is what we're aiming at at the end. But let's zoom in into the um, optimization algorithm. Exactly what is this IRIS thing? So IRIS, um, it actually stands for Iterated Racing. Uh, it's an open source package, which if you just Google IRIS R, you will find it very easily. Uh, but the whole thing, one of the nice aspects of IRIS is that it's very easy to explain. And it's one of the things we have in the conclusion that says, oh, it's very easy to explain even to your business stakeholders exactly how the algorithm works. And that fits perfectly in a half hour demo like this one uh, to explain conceptually how the uh, algorithm works and how the optimization gets to an optimized set of rules in the end. And the interesting thing is that it, it's kind of all in the name. It's it's called IRIS or iterated racing. And here it's racing like actual, you know, people behind in their cars, Formula One, rally drivers, you know, the racing like uh, the, the motorsport. Uh, and in fact, the whole algorithm can to some extent be explained with uh, an analogy of racing like that. So right, in the in the real world, right, you, you know, motorsport, so Obviously, I'm more of an IT person, etc. So sport, maybe not my my forte, but I'll try to explain it anyway. Uh, first in motorsport terms, and then bring it back to the more algorithmic side. But in in motorsport of um, <clears throat> of racing, you have different seasons, uh, and you have a winner or multiple winners. You know the best drivers in in one season, but you have multiple seasons, right? You, the competition is split in seasons, usually one season a year, something like that. And within one season, as I said, you have different drivers. And the different drivers, they're competing at, against each other to be the, the best driver that season. It's kind of the idea. Uh, but how are they competing? Well, there are, there are racers, they're drivers, pilots. So they're competing uh, with their cars on racetracks. Um, and typically, right, the best, the best one on a racetrack is the one with who, who did the racing the fastest, right? The, his time is the smallest. You know, it's kind of optimizing to have the shortest uh, time spent on the track by driving as fast as possible and driving faster than the other drivers. That's, that's kind of the idea. You're getting where I'm, you're probably getting where I'm hinting at that this is all about the optimization aspect. But okay, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but of course, uh, in fact, it's not just about driving as fast as possible because if you do something crazy on the, the racetrack, you, you might get some penalized for it. Uh, let's say you, you cause a collision and cause an accident. Uh, you, you might get, have some, some time added to your clock, uh, even though it's artificial. You, you did finish it faster than uh, the driver finished the, the, the race faster than, than, than it. Than he really did because you know we record the penal penalized version. Uh, but of course, right, the, the winners of a season is not the guy who wins one race; it's the, the the driver who wins overall across most of the races in the race tracks in the seasons. The the one the pilot that does the best, and on top of that, throughout the season, you might have some driver who you know drop out of the race because. After a few race tracks, they realize, okay, it's completely impossible that I win because I've performed so poorly the first few races. So I'll stop competing, start preparing for next year, for the next season. Uh, but typically that means what? That And also between seasons, you have people who go like, okay, I did so bad the last few seasons, I'll just drop out and retire uh, from my professional um, driver uh, motorsport uh, profession. And that means that between seasons, right, to the next season, the top drivers, the one who perform the best, stay on. And then they compete in the next season. And then in the next season, it's kind of the, all over the same thing again. It's the drivers, they all drive their car on the different racetrack. They get the time. Potentially, they get some penalties. And then you check the winner of the season is, again, the one who performed the best across all the different tracks. 
Uh, but of course, because some people dropped out during the season and some people dropped out between the two seasons, uh, you also need to add some newcomers. Otherwise, you know, after a few seasons, you only have two drivers driving. It's, it's no fun anymore to watch, right? Uh, so you have this concept of newcomers coming into it, uh, younger driver that try to drive more aggressively or something like that. They come in uh, to try and disrupt the, the who is the champion, the reigning champion of the season. So that's, you know, the clear analogy. This has nothing really scientific behind it. This is all about, you know, rally car drivers. Why am I talking to you about this? Well, if I replace season with iteration, already that should indicate something a bit more alg algorithmically correct. You don't have seasons, you have different iterations. Uh, in the end, a lot of algorithm work with iteration. That should be a term quite known to everyone. Uh, and it's kind of the same concept as the season, right? Um, and in our case, for uh, our usage of iRace, the drivers, well, they're not drivers, they're sets of parameters. Uh, iRace is a meta heuristic optimization thing, so it optimizes parameters of something else. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be the sets of parameters of a rule based decision engine. So we're going to have the set of driver. One driver is going to be rule A's of rule B's of rule C's on, and the threshold of rule C is this value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the second driver is going to be rule A's on, rule B's of, etc. Right, you get a bit the idea. There are different values of the full sets of parameter, each of them. And then you evaluate them. You see who is the best performing set of parameter on different uh, instances of your data, basically. Uh, not talking about race tracks anymore, right? You don't throw the parameters on spa francorchamps why, why would that do that? No, you throw it at uh, a subsample of your data. Um, in our case, we were using quarters worth of data. So we would test one set of parameters on all of the ap loan application that came in Q3 2015. And then that would be one driver racing on one racetrack. And then the second set of parameters, we test it again on the applications of Q3 2015. That's another driver racing on the same racetrack. And once all of the drivers raced on the first track, then we move on to all the drivers racing on the second track. So test again all of the sets of parameters, but this time on the data of Q4 2015. Uh, this is a bit of a similar thing to basically cross validation in the end, right? It's different split of the data, and you're applying different sets of parameters on uh, different periods uh, to then measure some qualitative um, KPI. In our case, that was the automation. Uh, and then comes in the penalty points. Those are the constraints that we have. So, for instance, uh, one of the constraints was we don't want to increase the default rate, uh, that would mean if uh, using a certain set of parameters on one of the quarters of data results in an increase in the default rate, uh, then we would not completely discard that set of parameters, but instead apply a penalty uh, to the, let's say, fitness measurement of uh, how good this particular set of parameters uh, performs on that period. And the same way that the, the, the winner of a season is the driver who performs good across all of the racetracks, in this case, the best set of parameters is the one who's going to be, the best sets of parameters are going to be the ones that perform well on all of your slices of data, on all of the periods of data that we, we put in there. Uh, so in this case, it's not the top drivers that stay on. It's the elite configuration, the elite sets of parameters that stay on until the next iteration. Um, and just like with you know, the analogy, uh, some of the worst performing ones get, discar get discarded throughout uh, the iteration. If they perform poorly on the first few quarters of data and there's no chance they're the best, which translate to statistic tests. Statistically, uh, they, we can show that the series of data uh, measurement on the different quarters is worse for these than for some of the better thing, better sets of parameters. 
then we stop testing them on the later quarters. Um, and at the same time, between seasons, we discard a bunch of sets of parameters, which are not among the top elite sets of parameters. Uh, and we add back to, for the next iteration, some new parameter sets. Uh, the main difference here with where it falls off a bit out of the analogy is that the new parameter sets are to some extent composed out of pieces taken from the uh, previous elite parameter sets. Uh, which would be a bit like if rally drivers had children together and then the next season the the, the number one and number two uh, rally driver get competing against their babies um something like that it falls off a bit the analogy but this is the part where it's it's very similar in fact to genetic algorithm if it's something you're familiar with um conceptually that you create new solutions new sets of parameters out of the bits of the previous iteration where it worked fine. And then you keep going on like that until uh, you basically converge to one or to the elite being the same, the elite solutions being the same uh, over multiple iteration. That means you're not improving anymore and you found your optimal sets of parameters. So of course this begs the question, why did we choose this particular algorithm and no other optimization algorithm, right? If we go down the, 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 the approach of using optimization, why this one, why not nothing else? Um, well, we think it offers multiple advantages, some of which are completely subjective, right? One, we think it's pretty cool, um, obviously absolutely subjective. And also it's something that was quite known by at least one of us, namely me, uh, because it's an open source package coming from a university. And guess what? It's the university where I studied. So that's why I already knew about the, the package and about the algorithm. Um, but on a more objective point of view, the advantages is, at least to us, it's quite easy to use and get going. Uh, it's simply just a R package to install. It offers the client uh, a, a terminal-based client, a command line interface. Uh, it's very much agnostic of whatever you're trying to optimize because the whole thing is built around the idea that it's optimizing some other black box. Like from the point of view of Iris, from the point of view of the R package, whatever it's optimizing doesn't matter. As long as it can call it through a bash script and that it gets a number out of it, Iris will be happy with it. It will try to optimize that number by changing the parameters it gives to that black box. Um, and also, it's quite easy to get good to, to set it up. There's basically three .txt file with a few parameters that you need to, to fill in. And then you're pretty, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, and all of that is very well documented, which is always a nice added value and not always the case in uh, all packages found online. Um, of course, one of the other added uh, value is that this is you know, the, the use case we were doing is clearly meta optimization of a set of business rules. And Iris is a meta optimization heuristic. It is a tool designed to do that. So that's always nice that you can use a tool specifically made for this, for this purpose, right? Um, and in terms of uh, compute time and just being able to run it, uh, it's very easy to set it up so that it's parallelizable uh, because it's just one of the parameters basically of Iris itself that you can just say launch X number of uh, uh, experiments. So X number of testing one set of parameters on one quarter of the, uh, of the data at the same time. Uh, and basically at that point, it's up to how much your platform has uh, of capacity you can go sky high on that number of parallelization, Iris would just launch all of them and then wait for them to finish to get back the, the fitness score. Um, now, of course, there is one known downside uh, is that it's it's one single objective optimization. So if you really want to optimize multiple objective, it's not so easy. Um, for us, it was fine because we really wanted to optimize one objective. We had extra constraints but we weren't aiming to both increase the automation and decrease the default. We were aiming at increase the automation, but you know, without harming the default, for instance. Um, so we weren't doing multiple objective optimization. 
So that's okay. Uh, but obviously, if you are, you might want to look into, you know, algorithms that are made to do directly multiple objective optimization. Um, this leads us to the results, which uh, Nelo has hinted at before that they're kind of confidential. As you can imagine, it's credit risk, it's sensitive topics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but overall, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, one of the only key feature we said we were told we can share publicly is that using this we improve by between 20 to 25 percent the automation rate um and yeah that's kind of how much we can we can we could say and in the conclusion the very final conclusion what we hope you remember from this is that this is a meta optimization approach uh we hope you can you think about this next time you're using, you're, you're starting a new project, uh, that not everything has to be a machine learning thing. It can also be a meta optimization uh, and that can offer similarly good results and make it more, uh, decrease time to market. Uh, and that specifically the package we've used Iris is quite easy to use and easy to explain. Um, and I'm being told we're running out of time. So that's the conclusion of this. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Quentin and Manuel and uh, Nela for the presentation. I didn't know about this of, about this algorithm, so I learned about it. Uh, I, I, we are over time, but I would like to do like one or two questions. There, there was one, actually there are two online, the one I didn't fully understand. So one question by Aiden, he was asking about the title of rules, business rules, like uh, he asked, is this about KO rules? I think it's knockout rules or override rules, does it make? Uh, yeah, yeah there, there are uh, there is different classification of the rules in the engine itself, um, and it is the knockout ones, which are basically the more legally obliged rules. Those we mm -hmm. can't touch, so then they don't go in the optimization. Okay. You know, for instance, a mortgage, one of the knockout rules, which can be publicly shared because everyone knows it, you cannot grant a mortgage to someone less than eighteen years old. Right? That's one of the business rules in the engine. That is a knockout rule. If the age of the client is less than 18, he's out. Right. Obviously, we can't optimize that, right? So it's more on all of the other, let's say, more credit risk based um, rules mm -hmm. that, that, that we're applying this. So I, I do, I also have another a question for me, actually. Um, so, of, of course, this, it does back the question did you try against another algorithm? And I, I'm thinking specifically about, um, and of course, you've we want to stay away from complex machine learning algorithms that are hard to explain. But I'm, I had this problem in the past myself, and there we we did exactly the same thing essentially, but we used a simple decision tree, still very well explainable. I was wondering if you tried another against another no, algorithm. No, we, did, we they, didn't. Uh, in the end, we didn't. Right? We obviously planned on trying a bunch of different things, but this was like, okay, this looks promising. This looks like the, the first thing we want to try. Mm -hmm. We did, and the results were absolutely satisfactory for the business stakeholders. And then, okay. like, okay. okay, then I guess we're going with that. <laughs> right? That's a bit. Uh... Okay. Well, if you, uh, I think, uh, if you do want to try against something else, mm -hmm. just to compare. I mean, at least for me, in the past, uh, using a simple decision tree that worked very well, very well explainable. So business still liked it, and that also worked very well. Yeah, might be an idea. Yeah, the 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 main thing as well, right? If you're replacing it with even a simple decision tree is um, they have this whole setup with sure. the business yeah. rules in production that works in a very specific way. And it's much more complex to replace it by something else than just say, drop off those rules and change that threshold, right? Mm. Um, well, so that's what the, what, well, you can, you can do the same thing with a decision tree. And you true. just change the thresholds and decide yeah. to keep rules or not. Okay, uh, I think we need to wrap up. <laughs> Thanks again for the very nice presentation. Of course.